Dr. Slack, uh, before the break, I had asked you about the issue of children who had been raped by members of their family, and you pointed out that that terminology wasn't even used in those days. It was re referred to as incest. Yes. But you became aware of a number of children who were in Winlayton who had suffered the abuse of incest. Yes. And was that recognised by you to be a crime, incest? Um, I'm not sure of the legal status, and, and, and it, it, yeah, it, it probably was, but it was not something that um, I would react, I would react to in that way. I, you know, I, I really don't know um, okay. where it stood at that time. Um, the whole sexual offences area was cleaned up a bit further down the track by Marcy and Eve, and, um, and that gave things much more clarity. But at that time, uh, it was seen more as a moral issue, I think, than a criminal issue. You mentioned Marcy and Neve, is that right? Yes. Could you just spell her surname? Uh, N-E-A-V-E. -E. And was she responsible for a report? or? She, a... she did a report on the sexual offences uh, uh, legislation in Victoria. Can you recall what time uh, I, what I era that give, was? I can't give you a date for okay. it. To the best of your memories, was it something like the late 1970s or or if, if you're not, if I'm prompting you in a... It may have been earlier than that, but, um, yeah. Do you, do you tell the Royal Commission that it was her report that opened your eyes uh, to this issue of incest being a crime? Uh, yes, I think so, yes. In spite of the fact that uh, you've told the Royal Commission that you saw it, it was seen in those days, from the mid to late 1970s, as a, a moral issue... <coughs> Mm -hmm. rather than necessarily a criminal issue. Yes. Was it recognised by you to be something that would cause the child severe trauma? Um, I don't think our appreciation of the level of trauma was anywhere near as great as it is today. Okay. If a staff member in Winlayton during your time there became aware that a child was the victim of incest, I'll use that terminology, <coughs> picking up on for the, these purposes. If a child became aware that the only sexual activity, I withdraw that, if a staff member became aware that the only sexual activity that a child might experience was an incestual abusive relationship with a family member, was there any policy that that child should not be released on weekend leave where the perpetrator would be would have access to them? Uh, I don't recall any written policy, but I think that it would have been a matter of common sense. And what would have been your expectation in relation to whether or not is appropriate for that child who was a victim in those circumstances to be put on depo provera? Uh, if the circumstances were that clear, I think that's very questionable. But um, uh, again, um, no, I, I think that, that is the answer. It's, it, it would not be appropriate. Do you? Uh, is your evidence that it would not be appropriate as an institutional response for a child to be placed on depo provera, where the only evidence of sexual activity was sexual activity in the form of incest? Yeah. I, I'm, I'm just finding it difficult to conceive of that combination of issues. Um, and, uh, um, I, you know, I, I, can't, I can't think of a circumstance where it would simply be seen as that is that simple? Okay. In, can, we've become, the Royal Commission is aware of the case of BGD, which yes. you've also become aware of. Yes, yes. That was 1979 after your time. Mm -hmm. But what the Royal Commission knows is that that child was suffering ongoing sexual abuse from her father, mm -hmm. that when she was released on weekend leave, she reported that there had been sexual advances again by her father, that she wanted that her father was forcing her to have sex and she wanted it to stop. There was no, no evidence of any other sexual activity with any other 
person, and that child was placed on Depot Provera while she was at Wynne Leighton. What do you say about that in terms of the institutional response a year after you'd left? I think that's a, it's, it's a very difficult situation to, um, uh, to take on board and um, uh, because there are, you know, issues to do with the risk of pregnancy and I, I suspect that people might not have uh, concluded that that would be the only sort of sexual activity that might be going on at the time. But, uh, and no, it's, it's not, it wouldn't be right for me to speculate about that. Um, if there was a view that it was the only sexual activity, because the evidence is that staff members did believe BGD, that she was being abused by... <laughs> if there was evidence that that was the sexual activity that was occurring, do you agree that that sends mixed messages from the institution for that child to be placed on depot? Uh, yes, you could see it that way, yep. And do you agree that the appropriate response in those circumstances where staff become aware of ongoing risk of sexual abuse would have been to report to the police, even back in the late 1970s, to stop the abuse? I'm not sure the report to the police would have been <coughs> the way they would go, but I think with hindsight it seems like a very logical with hindsight, the logical step to take was to ensure that police intervened to stop the abuse occurring. Do you agree? Uh, yes, I think so. What you haven't mentioned uh, what were the wishes of the child. Do, do you, in, you, you note the wishes of the child being relevant to the decision to be made at that stage? In, in relation to reports to the police, as far as I mean. um, In relation to ensuring that the abuse stopped, do you agree that it would not have been appropriate to make the child the decision maker as to how to stop the abuse? I agree. I think it required much more input than that. Yeah. You mentioned, just before I move on to the last topic, you mentioned before the break Dr Charles Slack being uh, leaving the department at some stage, correct? Are you aware of the circumstances in which he left? No, I'm not aware of the circumstances. Was he required to leave, to the best of your knowledge? Um, I, I do know that he was working in uh, youth welfare services uh, at one stage and that he um, moved to a position in head office, but I'm not aware of any of the circumstances of that. Dr Owen, in your statement... At paragraph 20, and I'll just have that on the screen, but you say, it's my opinion today that we did not do as much as was needed for the welfare of the children, especially in relation to their families and wider network. Now, could you just read that whole paragraph onto the record, if you don't mind? Uh, it is my opinion. Today, that we did not do as much as was needed for the welfare of the children, especially in relation to their families and wider network. Some of that was to do with the state of knowledge and expertise within the system at the time, but some of it was also to do with resourcing and what the state seemed to expect for word wards of the state. While I make that observation with the benefit of hindsight, it is a view that I have long held and I considered that attempting to obtain and maintain welfare for the children was a priority for me as a superintendent. In spite of your objectives while you were superintendent, do you accept that on reflection, during your time as manager of Women Leighton, there was not enough done to protect children from sexual abuse? I think that's a fair statement, yes. And there was not enough done to ensure that where a child reported sexual abuse, that was dealt with appropriately? Uh, yes. Nothing further. Uh, if I could just follow on from that uh, uh, briefly. Dr Owen, in um, your statement, paragraph 20, uh, you do say um, some of that was to do with the state of knowledge and expertise within the system at the time but some of it was also to do with resourcing 
and what the state seemed to expect towards the state. <coughs> then if we turn to uh, paragraph 62 of your statement, you say, from memory, I think there are about 80 to 100 staff in five sections, and uh, that the institution generally was home to between 80 to between 80 and 120 girls at any one time. That's correct. Now, now even if you um, have regard to having three shifts a day, that would still, in theory, be a high staff-to-girl ratio. So when you talk about resourcing, I presume you're not talking about numbers. You're talking about the kinds of people, are you, or the, the training they had? What, what is it you mean when you say the state didn't provide the resourcing necessary? Because they certainly provided you with a lot of staff. Uh, I think there is a question of numbers. Um, it sounds like a lot of staff working across five sections. But if you appreciate that it takes more than four staff to cover one position on the ground 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, then um, the number, the best I could squeeze out of that number in a unit um, was two on duty during the day, light hours, three on duty in the evenings, and one on duty um, overnight in each unit. And um, for a group of anything, you know, up to 15 girls, um, that wasn't a lot of people in my view. Um, so, there were questions also of the other matters that you mentioned. So when you say some of it was also to do with resourcing, do you only mean numbers or do you mean the type of training? Well, I mean, I mean the, the, um, uh, the extent to which we were able to ensure that we had always had trained staff. Um, and we had quite a backlog to catch up with that was evolving, developing over time. Um, and um, uh, the quality of staff, I believe, was generally good at Winlayton. There may have been some people who had some difficulties, but I was exceptionally pleased with the performance of the staff there generally. And what do you mean by what the state seemed to expect for wards of the state? Well, part of that is resourcing, in that it was extremely hard to get resources for anything. Um, um, but um, uh, there is also, I think, uh, a question of expectations. And in recent years, it's become very much more evident that um, wards of the state did not go on to higher education. Wards of the state... Um, did not get access to programs that we would expect for our own children very readily. Um, and uh, it's, it's only since there have been some very active um, uh, efforts that we've seen numbers of um, children who've been in care actually achieving in those educational and other areas of their lives. And the other aspect, I think, too, is the skills to work with families. That's changed dramatically over time. Do you mean at all that the state, in terms of a culture, had a view that very little could be expected of these children and that, um, uh, that they shouldn't be provided with all the opportunities uh, because um, their circumstances were such that there was a prospect for them? Uh, I would stop short of saying that that was a view of the state. But I think that um, the, um, um, the way in which things um, were delivered down the system, they, they were the people who were often given up on or not given access or excluded, um, rather than staying with them and their issues, which is often very, very difficult, um, uh, in order to see them through to the degree that we need to see them through. So it is my summary of your understanding of the time that rather than being a supportive environment, it was more a controlling environment? Uh, a containing, controlling, and um, 
putting things on hold until they grew up and hopefully grew out of it um, or found some other way of um, coping. I, I recall <coughs> uh, one of our exceptionally good chief youth officers at Widlayton, Alan Gibb, um, saying to me one time, <coughs> I think we're only helping these kids to survive, not thrive. Uh, no. <clears throat> May I ask a couple of questions? Yes, Mr. Scurry. Um, uh, Dr. Owen, my name is Charles Sherry. I'm hearing for the state. You were asked some questions by Dr. Dwyer about the BGD case. Do you recall that? Yes. And that case occurred after your time at Winlayton? Mm -hmm. Yes. And I think you said that... Well, it, it may have commenced earlier than that. I, I, that just, <laughs> I picked up the detail. But. And you said it was a very difficult circumstances and you didn't want to speculate about it. Is that right? Uh, that was in relation to the issue of contraception, I think, that those yes. questions were being asked. I want to ask you about that. Would it make any difference to your view about that case if you were told that the mother of BGD had consented to the administration of the contraceptive? Uh, yes, it would make a difference to my view, I knew that. And why is that, sir? Uh, in that I assume that she um, uh, stood in loco parentis in some measure, but I, what I don't know, of course, is the, the circumstances um, between the girl and her mother and the whole family context. Thank you. Uh, uh, Dr. Owen Carl is my name, and I appear for uh, Mr. Latham and a man known as uh, BDA, who uh, uh, Mr. Latham was held at Tarani Youth Training Centre in the early 60s, 1962 and 1963, and BDA in 1993 and 1994. You have said that you worked at uh, Tirana between 1968 and 1971, haven't you? Yes. <laughs> and during those four years, you worked three years... I'm sorry, you studied full-time for three of them, did you? Three of the four, I was away most of the time, but um, I was mm. there quite a bit. And in the early part of your time at Tirana, were you working in the administration centre? Yeah, I was in the office and the store. And in the latter part, um, were you employed as an assistant superintendent? Uh, after graduating, I was assistant superintendent with some duties at Toronto. And did those duties as assistant superintendent require you to work within the different units at Toronto? Uh, it did take me into the different units. May I ask you some questions about when you arrived at Tirana in 1968? Um, in relation to the staff, um, many of the youth officers uh, were ex-armed forces servicemen, weren't they? Uh, I believe that's the case. I certainly met many who were. Um, some were ex-police. Uh, possibly. Um, Tirana to use your words, was a containing environment, wasn't it? Uh, yes, it was. Um, were uh, many of the... Um, I'm sorry, were the armed... The, the, were the officers with the armed services and police background recruited to Tirana <coughs> because of a perceived training and experience in exercising discipline? Uh, I expect that would be the case. And when you arrived, um, at least some of the officers who were working there had been in the job for many years, hadn't they? That would be true. <laughs> and in the case of some of them, they may well have presented appropriately to um, the superintendent and their superiors, but may well have been capable of abusive behaviour towards the boys. I object to that. <clears throat> and object What's to that? the basis of the objection? Well, I'm about to tell you. 
I object to it on the basis that the question is a castle built on a cloud that's built on a passing wind. Can't hear you, Mr Cooney. I'm objecting to it on the basis that it's a castle built on a cloud that's premise <coughs> that is not made out either in the instructions that my friend can have in relation to the period of time that this witness can give evidence about, and it's not a matter that um, does anything other than to assist the Commission to hear speculation in my respectful submission. Um, it's a question that I put to the witness on the basis of a discussion that I had with him yesterday uh, and a discussion that I had with him after first speaking to my learned friend about talking to Dr Owen. It's a question that I put to him. It's a question he gave me an answer to and in my submission it's appropriate yes, for him on. to Pro answer. Proceed, Mr Carl. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, think, I think you're saying <clears throat> that it's possible for somebody to present some people in one way and then to be behaving in other ways. Yes. Um, and I think that's true of any place, right. um, but not just specifically Chirana, but I think it was possible that things happen. Um, but I'm asking you about when you arrived at Tirana, there were amongst the officers who were working there people who would present to their authority figures in one way, but um, deal with the boys differently. Yeah, I'm not aware of any specific instances. No, but you're aware from working in the environment of that it's possible. possibility, aren't you? Mm -hmm. Now, can I just ask you about the Bombay and Coolabar units? Do you remember them? I do. Yep. Thank you. They um, were contained within a single building, weren't they? Uh, they were, yeah. And were separated by a passageway. That's true, yep. Yeah. Now... <coughs> Another witness before this commission had given evidence um, that uh, during uh, the late uh, 60s there were often problems with overcrowding in Tirana. Did you experience that while you were working there? Um, yeah, I, I, I can't specifically. I, we had overcrowding in every institution at some point in time, and I think at Girona that was the case. Right. I'm not sure of a specific time. And at some times when there was overcrowding, <laughs> to try to manage that situation, <laughs> boys were moved between units, weren't they? Oh, yes, that was common. Mm. And <laughs> it wasn't uncommon to move boys from... Quamby to Coolabar or vice versa, was it? may have been the case, but I was not close enough to the action there to, to be able to answer that um, fully. Were you aware of short-term movement of boys between units to try to deal with overcrowding problems? I can't, I can't remember any specific occasion of that sort. It would be a common practice in most places. Right including Tirana. In Tirana, there was a um, trainee information file kept for each boy, wasn't there? Yes. When you were working in administration, did you um, perform any duties in um, keeping records of that nature? Um, no, not in relation to the trainee files, no. <clears throat> OK, you've answered that. Thank you, there are my questions. Thank you, Your Honour. Um, now, uh, Dr. Rowan, my name is Carmen Randazzo. I appear on behalf of Dr. Slack. I've been told I don't speak loudly enough, so I'm going to try and keep my voice up. Um, I want to just ask you a few questions about your time with Dr. Slack before you left in 1978. Uh, first of all, when you left in 1978, there was a period of time... Um, you were seconded, in fact, in 1978 to go and do another job for the department. Is that correct? Uh, yes, I was. Yes. yes. And during that time, um, uh, Dr Slack uh, took over as acting superintendent? I believe so, yes. Yes. Um, then when you finally did uh, leave in 1978, the position um, at your position at Wimlayton, it was um, shortly after that, as far as you are aware, that Dr Slack took on the full-time position and role of superintendent of Wing Layton. Uh, yes, we, we, yes. When, I, when I was totally out of the institution, yes, she was. Thank you. Mm. 
Um, when doctors, there'll be some evidence. Um, well, maybe I'll ask you this. I'll withdraw that and ask you this. Have you seen Dr Slack's statement? Uh, have you known Dr Eileen Slack's statement? I have. I've, I've seen two documents related to me, but I've not seen Dr Slack's statement. I see. Um, Dr Slack um, describes arriving at the um, Winlayton uh, Youth Training Centre to take up her role initially as deputy, um, su as deputy superintendent, in um, October 1976. Does that accord with your memory? It would, yes. Yes. Um, and at the time that she arrived, her husband had also arrived with her in Australia and was taking up the position of superintendent or at least heading a, um, a facility that was run out of Parkville. Is that correct? Uh, yes. Yes. Now, um, it became abundantly clear that um, Dr Slack was uh, making her presence felt pretty much from the moment she arrived. Mm -hmm. Do you agree with that as a general proposition? Oh, yes. Yes. Um, and she has described uh, in her statement to the Commission um, arriving and finding um, absolute mayhem, in her words. Now, um, do you take issue with that? Uh, I do. You do? Yes, yes I and wouldn't have described it as mayhem. You would say that there was a degree of control being exercised um, uh, that was... Um, sufficient or adequate at the time within the institution? Uh, I believe it was um, uh, as good as could be achieved in all of the circumstances, but I would not describe the situation as mayhem. Would you describe it as controlled? Uh, generally, yes. Uh, Dr Slack has also um, uh, stated in her uh, statement to the Commission that she was um, uh, effectively headhunted by the department and convinced to leave her position as superintendent in uh, Alabama at the Chalkville Youth Training Centre um, over a period of some six months. Now, does that accord with your memory as well? Uh, I, I believe so. I know she was interviewed by a, a recruiting officer um, and then later seen by the Director General when he was on a trip to the United States. Yes, that there were in fact two persons who, um, I think one was uh, Ken Williams, is that right? Who was the... I'm not aware, no, I don't think Ken Williams uh, was there. It was Ben Bodner, the Director General, and Don oh. Taylor was the personnel person. Excellent. So um, you understood that Dr Slack was being asked to come to Australia to work at Winlayton to assist in the situation there? Uh, I was aware that she was being invited to come to work at Winlayton as my Deputy Superintendent. That wasn't really my question, Dr Rowan. Sorry? My question was that she was being sought after because of her expertise, because of her experience and because of her being fairly widely published in the um, field of social welfare of children? Uh, I, I don't think um, that degree of detail was brought to my attention. All right. One of the other things that um, uh, she describes is... An impression that she gained, and I'll just see if I can find it, when she arrived at Winlayton, of there being a degree of mistrust um, and, pardon me, Your Honour, I'm just trying to, yes, here we go. What she states is this. It appeared to me in my early days that life among the staff and residents went on in amid fear, mistrust and intimidation. Do you agree with that statement? I don't. I, I think it's overstating it. I think there's an element of those uh, issues, but um, um, not, not a major emphasis. Now, some of the documentation that has been shown to you this morning relating to... Um, uh, Deepo Provera and also the examination 
of um, the Wynn Leighton residents, medical examinations that were conducted of the Wynn Leighton residents, they were clearly issues about which Dr Slack was quite vociferous. Uh, they were, yes. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it, it, it may describe it, but I, I, I wouldn't... You know, that sounds a little bit more extreme when you when you put it that way than right. I felt well, it I'll, was. I'll, I'll <laughs> try and be um, as, uh, as balanced as I can be. But um, the fact is that, is it not, that uh, after Dr Slack arrived, um, she set about bringing to your attention a number of very concerning issues uh, relating to the residents, the staff and the facilities, didn't she? Uh, yes, she did um, um, raise some issues. Mm -hmm. um, and her position as Deputy Superintendent was Deputy Superintendent of Programs, which was quite distinct from the position of Deputy Superintendent for Case Planning and Classification. Correct? Uh, I don't recall that distinct, distinction quite so clearly now. It may have been the case that we right. split it that way. Mm -hmm. um, in 1976, um, uh, when Dr Slack arrived, there was in existence a manual of instruction for Wynne Layton? Uh, I believe so, yes. Yes. Um, and that manual, as you have already given evidence about, was being, um, if you like added to from time to time? Yes. Is that correct? The 1976 manual, or 1970, I beg your pardon, it might have been 1974, I beg your pardon, when it was originally printed in August of 1974, that manual did not contain any policy or procedure in relation to either grievance hearings or serious incident hearings. Do you agree with that? I think that would be the case, yes. Yeah. And indeed, it was Dr Slack who developed a policy and procedure um, for, the, for grievance hearings as well as serious incident hearings. <coughs> Do you recall that? Uh, <clears throat> yes, she did develop, which was uh, quite an elaborate process, as a grievance hearing. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and it was used to deal with incidents, but I believe that we also did have a process prior to that time for dealing with grievances and incidents. And serious incidents? Yes, yeah. Um, but you say that was not part of the original it, Winlanton it, it manual? It may not have found its way into the manual. Mm. Um, the the uh, procedure and policy developed in relation to grievance and serious incident hearings uh, was incorporated into the update to the manual in 1980 uh, when the manual was revised, by which time you had obviously already I left. Gone. Yes. But you knew that that process had been commenced and indeed, that is, the process of developing the um, policy and implementing it had already been commenced and indeed... Uh, implemented before you left. Oh, yes, I, I, was, I was part of some of those hearings, yes. Yes, thank you. Um, have you seen the, um, the 1918 Manual of Instruction? Have you been shown the revised 1918 Manual of Instruction for Wynne Layton? I don't think I have. No. I wonder if um, DHS 3004-001... 0119, which is page 37 of the 1980 revised Winlayton of Instruction Manual. Could we put up on the screen, please?
I've got it on my screen. Oh, it's come up on your screen? Oh, excellent. It's headed serious incident hearing. Do yes. you have that? Yes. Well, I think maybe I might read wait for it to come up and hopefully in the meantime it might come up. Now this is, um, first of all, you recognise this as the policy that was developed and implemented by um, Dr Slack and others, of course, with contribution from others. Do you agree with that? Uh, yes. Yes. Um, and in the first page, under the heading serious incident hearing, uh, it reads as follows. While the formal grievance hearing is reserved for the major incidents of one assault on staff by a girl or two setting a fire, and the grievance hearing just um, for the purposes of the transcript and you, Dr Rowan, is explained um, on the previous page of the manual. The serious incident hearing can be set up to deal with serious incidents in which staff think that the behaviour of a trainee has endangered herself or others or has damaged property. <coughs> this would include incidents such as um, vicious fighting between girls, attempted drownings, sexual assault and premeditated or continuous vandalism. Do you see that? Yes, I do. It recognises, does it not, or it demonstrates, does it not, that there was uh, some understanding and appreciation of sexual assaults occurring um, at Winlayton? Yes, it does. Or the potential for them, yes. Yes. Certainly, the potential for that, at the very least, was recognised by Dr Slack at the time, yes. wasn't it? Now, the... The other thing which um, is, if you could scroll down just a fraction to the last paragraph, which is that third paragraph, and this is um, a, a procedural question. Um, at any time that a, that a serious incident hearing uh, was in fact conducted, um, the notes from that serious incident hearing and the consequences and outcome of it were to be recorded and placed on the um, girl's green file. Do you see what it says there? Yes, that? I Bottom? see that, yep. With copies going to both the youth and the Deputy Superintendent of Treatment. Yes. Now, can I just ask you, there's two brief questions. The green file was the main file that was usually kept um, near the Deputy Superintendent for Treatment or Classification and Case Review. Yes. Um, that's where that was, green file was kept. And Deputy Superintendent of Treatment, I think it's clear, is it not? That's the Deputy Superintendent um, responsible for case planning and classification. Agreed? Uh, yes, it would be, although um, uh, I, I don't have that title in my mind. So no. it may have it's, grown it's, up, a, it's a little different to mm. how you understand it. I appreciate that. Um, now, the next thing I want to ask you about uh, some of the other, uh, and I, I hesitate to say initiatives, but some of the other issues certainly that Dr Slack, apart from Depot Provera and the issue of medical examinations, um, of uh, uh, trainees and residents at uh, Wynne Leighton. Some of the other um, issues that she was actively pursuing and involved in, not, not by herself, I'm not suggesting that, but certainly that she initiated and um, uh, encouraged others to become involved in, included the um, tattoo removal program. Yes. Are you familiar with that? Uh, yes, although that had commenced before her arrival. Yes. Um, and upon her arrival, she developed uh, a written policy and um, a procedure for she that may, program. She may have developed a written policy. I'm not aware of that, but mm -hmm. it's very likely. Uh, some, a, another um, matter that she was actively involved in was the... Uh, removal of the barbed wires. Do you recall that? Was that in your time? 
No, I don't, rec I don't recall that and I don't think it was in my time. All right. Um, can you say this about, well, can you say anything about the facilities themselves? Well, I'll withdraw that and ask you this. Do you recall being interviewed by a um, Dr Hamilton for a literary... Yes, yes I do. Mm. Yes. Uh, Your Honour, um, if I could have, please, uh, stat 0630.001.0055 placed on the screen. Uh, Dr M Hamilton um, interviewed yourself and, indeed, Dr Slack as well... Yes. ..for an article or for a um, paper that she wrote entitled A Process of Survival... Have you you've seen that? I have, yes. Yes. It was published, as I understand it, in the literary Overland Literary <coughs> Journal in the winter of 2014. It's an online journal, journal yes. Mm. Um, yes. Yes, an online journal. Yes. Uh, yeah, I believe it's um, just <coughs> online. Now, she speaks um, in her, state, in her um, article or her paper about um, speaking uh, to you about the facilities the actual physical facilities, if I could yes. put it that way. And she describes them, um, if we could scroll down to the next page, please. So the, the heading, dark, I think we might, might be just there, dark, dull and demoralising. You see that? Yes, I see that. She um, describes the um, uh, facilities as being um, in a poor state. Uh, and indeed, um, somewhat uh, dilapidated, damaged buildings in need of essential repairs. Is that your memory of the facility, certainly, in the time that you were there? Uh, it certainly was in need of considerable maintenance. Um, and I campaigned quite strongly to try and develop a cyclic maintenance program. I'm not being critical of you, I'm just but, trying to assess but, it as a time. Yes, yeah, there, there, there was um, a backlog in maintenance work. And one of the, um, one of the things about it was that it was, it was covered pretty much in this very ugly and, and run-down barbed wire around the exterior, was it not? Uh, it had barbed wire on the top of the fence of the main compound yes. and on the top of the fence of Winbira. Um, Remand Centre, yes. And are you aware, um, and this may have been after your time, but are you aware that Dr Slack was um, uh, involved in uh, re having that barbed wire removed? I don't, I don't recall that. But... It wasn't in your time. Is that what you're saying? You don't recall it being no. in your time? There were extensive building works which I'd initiated going on at the time I left and after I left. Yes. Thank you. Um... In your time there, um, were you aware of the use of um, tranquilizers for behaviour control? Uh, yes. Mm. And uh, you um, came to uh, learn that um, Dr uh, Slack was very much opposed to the use of tranquilizers for um, behaviour control? Um, that was her opinion, but I should add that... Um Almost at the time of my arrival at Winlayton, um, I was called to an incident where uh, it was proposed that a girl be sedated with a tranquilliser, and I challenged that view. And I don't believe um, that sort of uh, uh, treatment happened from then on. Now, when was that? Well, that would have been in 1974 when I arrived. 1974. And are you I, saying I, I, that there was no I use? So. And you're saying that that uh, subsequent to that event, there was no further <coughs> use of tranquilizers. Well, the, well, the use control? of tranquilizers to control behaviour, um, you know, thinking in terms of um, incidents of violence, etc., or um, distress. Um, certainly, I was opposed to the use of injections to achieve that. Tranquilizers may have been used as part of treatment prescribed by psychiatrists or others for 
um, some diagnosed conditions. All right. Well, you certainly, as you say, um, were opposed to the use of <coughs> tranquilizers for behaviour control, um, and certainly when Dr. Slack came to the um, came to the youth training centre, she too expressed her disapproval of it. Yeah. Um, did she not? Do you agree um, with that? Yeah, yeah. I, I don't think they were being used at that time in that way. So, um, but I, I, she agreed with that view. Mm. Um, there were other um, initiatives that um, you might have been around for before you left, but um, the Tattoos um, Shape Your Future program was one of them. Um, there was also uh, an initiative taken or funds obtained after Dr Slack arrived there to subsidise work experience programs, ones where Wimlaton students undertook voluntary work in the community and the institution paid them. Do you recall that? Or was that after your time? I can't, re I can't recall the payment aspect of that, but we did um, have a str very strong policy of enabling uh, young people to work out of the institution as part of the employment program. If As we part could. of the employment, this, this, this was a slightly different, it was um, really undertaking voluntary work. Voluntary work community. experience, yeah. No, I, I, I can't recall that, although as you talk, there's a bit of a glimmer going off. But, yep. um, okay. Um, the Winlayton Radio Room was established, was that in your time? Not in my time, in but time? I, I uh, understood that uh, to occur, yep. Yes, thank you. Um, all right, well, can I just ask you one further thing, if I may. The hierarchy um, of the uh, institution, the, the staff establishment hierarchy I'm talking about here, um, when you left in 1978, was it the case that um, there was the superintendent at the top who had ultimate responsibility, correct? Yes. And below the superintendent, um, there was a deputy superintendent for programs and a deputy superintendent for case planning and classification. I don't think that had happened by the time I, before I left. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, I may be wrong. But, um, well, what was, what's your memory of it? Uh, below the superintendent, who was the next person had, down in we, the we, we had a superintendent, deputy superintendent, and, at various, and an assistant superintendent, and at some times we had two assistant superintendents. Right. Now, where did but this... I'm, I'm just, I'm just re reflecting on that, okay. because it's, it's possible that we may have achieved two deputies. Um, I know that was an aim um, that we had. And it was an aim, certainly, that... Um, well, you've already said that when um, Eileen Slack arrived, she arrived as a deputy superintendent, <coughs> and we've already heard evidence from this minister that she too was a deputy superintendent in October of 1976. So there must have been two deputy superintendents. Yeah, I would have thought that she may still have been a, an assistant superintendent at that time, but, but right. that could be correct. Well, let's put it this way. Below the deputy superintendent, then, you had one principal youth officer. Yes. Um, below the principal youth officer, there were three chief youth yes. officers. And below the chief youth officers, there was the senior youth officers, of which there were about ten. Yes. And then below them were the allocated youth officers on each section. Yes. And that was essentially the chain of command, if you like, was it not? Um, was there a practice, uh, uh, and I think you've you may have already, in one way, given evidence about this, but can I ask you to confirm, <coughs> whilst you were superintendent, um, was there a practice of serious cases, and I'm not talking here about um, necessarily abuse allegations or sexual abuse allegations within Winlater, but serious cases of admitted uh, residents and trainees being brought to your attention for specific oversight? Not sure that I follow that question. Right. I'll, I'll make it a bit. Um, 
An admission, uh, for example, and this is, this is uh, using the example, if I can, respectfully, of BGD, um, which you would describe as being a serious case of um, sexual abuse by a father towards her daughter, quite clearly, agreed. Um, upon admission, would such a case, was there a policy of such a case being brought to the superintendent's um, attention or oversight in your time? Not, not for exclusive oversight, but I would have expected that, that any case that had serious implications would be brought to the attention of the superintendent. Thank you. And you've already spoken about the expectation. Um, but even with that expectation, you have no memory of any specific case, serious case, of an admitted young girl being brought to your attention, do you? Uh, I can think of many cases of young girls brought to my attention for all sorts of reasons. Yes. But... Um, uh, I assume you're referring to the, the, the case of um, the incest, that, which, which I don't... Cases of incest. Let's mm. put it cases of incest. Well, any cases of incest. You were not there when BGD, as I understand it, came no. to the um, mm -hmm. to win later. But cases of incest, which you would describe, would you not, as serious cases of sexual abuse? Uh, well, I, I think they would have been brought to my, my attention. Um... um you know, because it, it, it was, it was um, a serious issue. And I, and I can recall one in particular, but um, um, uh, certainly you would say, would you not, that you had an expectation <coughs> that that type of case would be brought to your attention? I, I would think so, yes. But you can't say that it was in every circumstance, in every situation? Well, yeah, not necessarily, but I, I think it would have been. Yeah. Thank you. Now, just very briefly about um, the triad program, you describe in um, your statement um, at paragraph um, Uh, 71, you say this, in relation to the triad therapy, I spent some time attempting to review it and consider its usefulness. Ultimately, I took the view that it was suitable to the interests of the children and was similar to a degree to an earlier group approach called guided group intervention, in brackets, Larry Brentro, B-R-E-N-D-T-R-O and others, close brackets. Um, that early approach, as I understood it, aimed to harness the power of peer, peers towards a productive and seemingly supportive and supportive resolution. To that extent of that similarity, I thought that triad therapy, as proposed, would be a worthwhile um, undertaking. You see that in your statement, I do, paragraph yes. 71? Yes, uh, there, there is an amendment on my copy. Yes. Uh, the word intervention, guided group intervention has been changed to guided group Interaction, which was the title of that particular. Oh, I'm operation. sorry, guided group interaction. Interaction, it be, yes. Just before Larry Brentro and others. Yeah, is that right? it, it, yes. Um, you, uh, you would agree with me, would you not, that um, Dr. <coughs> Slack, um, and indeed her husband at the time, Dr. Charles Slack, um, had both been involved, or, to your knowledge, had both been involved in triad therapy in the United States. I believe that was the case, yes. yes. Um, and that they came over with that model already yes. um, familiar and well known to them. Yes. And that they presented that as a, um, as a program which Dr Slack certainly um, was very well intentioned yes. in her um, aim to use it as a therapeutic yes. model. Yes. And the review of that program that was being proposed to you by Dr Slack, um, you undertook by comparing it to previous programs and seeing whether or not there were any benefits 
um, that might be obtained from it? Yes. It's the case, is it not, that um, Dr Slack's um, intentions, as far as you were concerned, um, were for the program to assist the residents in particular? Yes. Now, um, in hindsight, um, you can look back and see from the evidence of various survivors, um, certainly, that for many of them, it didn't work. Do you agree with that? Yes, I'm not, I've not seen any formal assessment of that, but, um, but I, I believe that there has been concern expressed from a number of quarters, some of which I'm aware. Yeah. Um, but that in no way impacts, you would say, upon the um, well-meaning intentions of Dr Slack when she introduced <coughs> that program to you as a therapeutic No, I've model. got no doubt about her well-meaning intentions. Now, just uh, again, this is the last <coughs> topic, if I may. Um, <coughs> yes. Would you agree with this proposition? Um, one of the incentives or indeed one of the um, issues that Dr Slack was concerned about was um, that of opening up the institution to assessment um, from the outside, if you like. Yes. Um, and uh, she had a very strong view, did she not, about accountability to the public, about being able to integrate the community, if you like, into the much more secluded community of the of Wimlayton. She did, as, as did I, and, um, and we had made um, various moves to both have young people out in the community more and the community in the institution more. And she also introduced, and this might not have been in your time, but she also um, involved the institution in what she describes as um, evaluation. Were you around when that process was going on? No, I'm not quite sure what you mean by evaluation in that circumstance. I'll, I'll, tell, I'll, I'll tell you what, um, how she describes it in her statement. I am sorry, Jan, I'm just trying to locate. Yes, here we go. This is paragraph um, uh, 59 of her statement. She, she writes this, Dr Lowen, in late 1980, early 1981, Wing Youth Training Centre undertook a self-evaluation. This, this process took over a year to organise and intimate Implement. <coughs> Ms. Holmes, just, so this, this is a period after. After, Dr. yes. And I just left. wanted to ask one question arising <coughs> from that. That um, what Dr. Slack is saying is that in um, late 1918, early 1981, clearly when you are not there, she undertook um, a self-evaluation sort of self mm -hmm. process <coughs> and describes how she did that. Was mm -hmm. that something that um, had either commenced? or been implemented um, before you left Wynne Layton? Uh, I, I, don't, I don't think so. Um, evaluation is always um, an important issue, but um, 
I'm, I'm, I'm not aware of, um, uh, although, although she mentions the task force too. Yes, which, which came later in, in that's a, that, that was a later issue. No, no, I think, she, I, I assume she's talking about a, a process of self-evaluation within the institution, which is yes, common yeah. in organisations. Yes. And, um, I, but I'm not aware of the detail of that. All right, thank you. Yes, thank you. No further questions. Mr Kernigan. I'll be very brief, Your Honour. Yes. So, sorry, before you do, um, I have some questions on behalf of BGD, if I may. How long are you likely to be, Mr O'Brien? Not very long at all. Um, what does that translate into? Uh, I've only one area, perhaps five minutes. Right. Let's keep going. My name's O'Brien, sir. Um, I represent BGD in these proceedings. Um, you're asked by um, the legal representative of the state about a consent form which uh, apparently is uh, available, suggesting that the mother of BGD had given consent for the use of Depo Provera upon BGD as a contraceptive. Do you remember being asked about that? I do, yep. yep. Um, I understand that BGD wasn't there the time that you were in su a superintendent, or perhaps there was a short period of crossover. Mm -hmm. You accept that? Uh, yes. But if, in circumstances where a child was a ward of the state, where would you expect to get consent for the issuing of depot injection for contraceptive from the mother or the, or the state? Yeah, I'm not absolutely certain um, because there was a policy emerging about including parents in the process of um, uh, issuing consent for anything. Um, even, even in the case where a child was a ward and therefore the parental responsibility had been shifted from the parents mm -hmm. to the state? Um, yes, although the responsibility would not rest with the mother alone, I don't think, in that, in that instance. So if she was a ward of the state. I, I'm asking you to cast your mind back mm -hmm. To, to your period, your time as uh, superintendent, mm -hmm. it would have been your expectation then that there would be some involvement by the department um, in addition to that of the parents in relation to consent? Just to get a light around the processes um, uh, that were operating at... Um, uh, at the time, and I'm, I'm not, I, I, I really can't answer that um, very clearly because my mind's going to well, who, in, who in the department would be the person issuing the consent. Well, you gave evidence uh, whilst being asked by counsel assisting about this issue of, of consent that it was a vexed, mm. uh, to the effect that it was a vexed issue yes. at the time. Yes. Uh, are you saying that, that, that even now you, 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 you're unable to recall or it's because of that? complexity of the issue at the time that yeah, you were able to uh, well, well, both. It is, it is a com complex issue and, and I'm unable to recall, you know, exactly the processes that were occurring at the time. Thanks. Mm -hmm. no Mr Sherry, are you able to assist the Commission in shedding light on what exactly the legal position was with respect to the Director's authority? I can't at the moment, Your Honour. We received a request by email yesterday asking lots of questions about this yes. and we're trying to answer those the best we can right. but we do need to make more inquiries. Um, the position yesterday was a bit concerning I have to say because it was said a couple of times that there were no consents had been located and we had provided some consents to the Commission months ago and in particular... Are these consents from, from the Director? No, in particular, there was a consent from the mother of yes. the GD. Yes. Um, but we are trying to follow up the questions we got by email last night 
and we hope to provide some more information about that to the Commission as soon as we can. So, and I, I assume I haven't seen the email, but I, I assume the focus of it is firstly for, um, for you to assist the Commission in understanding um, uh, who uh, had the legal authority to make decisions such as medical procedure decisions uh, and movement of a child who was... Uh, I, think, I, think, I think that was covered, Your Honour, and it was also... My recollection is it was covering a long period and asking what was happening at different times. What we have said to the Commission is that we will look into those questions, but, and if in particular, what we do say on the record is that we haven't been asked previously to identify consent forms for particular people, and we're happy to do that if those people are identified. BGD is a special case yes. because we had we had located her consent and yes. had provided it. No, I do appreciate that, but you also appreciate um, you being asked a separate question. We are, Your Honour, and we're following that up as, as quickly as we can. Oh, thank you. Um, Mr Kernigan, um, I, I don't want to press you. If you feel you need more time, happy to adjourn and come back at two. Uh, Your Honour, I, I can indicate I'm in Your Honour's hands, but I won't be any more than five minutes. Five minutes? Are you uh, all right to proceed, Dr Owen? Yes, that's five right. minutes. Let's do that. Um, so I'll just show you a journal article that my friend for Ms Slack showed you before. It's the document STAT.0630.001.0001. And while that's being brought up, I'll just indicate for those watching that I'm your lawyer and my name's Kernigan. And Can you speak a little bit? I'll just take you to the second, the second page of that document. just need to lift your voice a little bit. I'm sorry, Mr. Kernigan. The second page of that document, <coughs> under the heading dark, dull, dirty and demoralising. You'll see in the second paragraph a reference to the journalist's observations of the rapport uh, that was enjoyed between yourself and the girls at the time. Do you see that, the last sentence? Uh, <clears throat> which, what, what? Second paragraph, last sentence. Oh, the journalist, yeah, the girls enjoyed an obvious rapport with the superintendent, yes. Yes, and, and what's contained in the next paragraph is that uh, an accurate summary of the efforts that you engaged in to revitalise the facility? Uh, so, sorry, would you just repeat that question? The next paragraph, yeah. is that an accurate summary of the efforts that you engaged in to revitalise the facility? Uh, I'm not sure that we're on the same paragraph. Is that the, despite Owen's efforts, is that... that no, the paragraph before that. The, oh, right, OK. Uh, campaigns that government to adequately fund. Yeah, yes. Um, and that was around about the time of 1975. Yes. You were asked a question by council assisting, and to assist the commission, it's a transcript reference 9493 from today, in relation to instances of aggression at Wynn Leighton that you had observed in 1974. Do you remember being asked that this morning? Uh, yes, yes. We're asked uh, in terms of what you had experienced at Wynn Leighton in 1974 with the aggression between residents and from residents to staff, you were asked if that had changed over the time that you were there. You remember being asked that question? Yes. And uh, you reflected that, th that there, had, there may have been change and that yes. there were times when there was an up and down in the amount yes. of incidents, you recall that? Yes. It's the case, isn't it, that during your tenure as superintendent, you in fact enjoyed a positive, a positive interaction with the residents there? Yes. Is that right? I believe so, yes. And is it the case that in 19, 
74, the year that you were being asked questions about, you were given a present by a group of the children who were resident there? Yes. And that was for your birthday. Is that right? True. Yeah. I'm just going to show you an object. It's a book entitled The Sonnets of William Shakespeare. And I just ask that you open the, the document, or the book, and uh, read out the date. Uh, 20th of June, um, 74. And without naming the names that are included there, there's a collection of names of people, is that right? Yes. And they are each residents of Winlayton at that time? Yes. And uh, are you aware that one of those names is one of the witnesses who've given evidence in uh, these proceedings to the Royal Commission as a survivor? Yes. And can you read the uh, dedication on the right-hand page? Uh, you, you travel through life with a smile and a soft word. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I'll just stop you there. Can you read it from the top? Oh. Yeah, you travel. Not, not the quote. Oh, not the quote. Without re referencing the names. Oh, to Mr Owen on your birthday from. Yes. And then the next part, without uh, mentioning the names. After the list of names, you want the... Yes, please. The, the, uh, what they say. Uh, you travel through life with a smile <clears throat> and a soft word, uh, sharing your world, asking not for a tomorrow, but living today. Uh, we admire and love you for what you are to us, a friend, but not really. You're more than a friend, for our friendship is not questioned. It will continue to grow long after we have parted, and at times we'll be close through a passing memory of a, of a, wandering, of a wandering dream. We wish you happiness today, tomorrow, as you travel on, spreading your love and warmth as you live. And that um, was written in midway through 1974, sir? Yes. <clears throat> and um, is that the nature of the relationships that you were trying to engender that you refer to in your statement? Uh, yes, I think it reflects it to a considerable degree, yes. And it's the case, isn't it, that you've provided to this Royal Commission copies of letters from persons who were at various times throughout your time as superintendent resident at Winlayton? Yes. And it's fair to say, isn't it, that those letters reflect a desire to communicate to you about the successes and ups and downs in the lives of those persons who had been resident? That's true. <laughs> and to continue to disclose to you a number of personal and private details about their life moving on after Winlayton? Yes. <clears throat> And is it fair to describe those uh, letters or those correspondences as positive? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honour Commissioners. <coughs> um, I have four very short questions. If Your Honour's content for me to continue or come back, then Your Honour's... We'll, we'll take the lunch break now and return it to...